Well, we are in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. As you're doing that, I have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, the annual turkey bowl for the youth slash fathers who still want to play with their kids and play flag football is today. Uh, and we are meeting at Chestnut Ridge uh, at 2 o'clock. 2 to 4 o'clock, we'll be uh, throwing the football around. It's I was hoping for a nice fall day, and it's like a winter classic, I guess, out there. And so we're still going to have a lot of fun, so I encourage you to come on out to that 2 to 4 o'clock at uh, Chestnut Ridge. We're going to be meeting right by the uh, Sledding Hill, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun um, with that. Uh, also, the men's breakfast, breakfast is coming up December 1st uh, at 8.30. We meet over there uh, in the East Room. Uh, Scott Hunt and team are putting together uh, some, some food for us. Uh, I just found out because I just asked him, Joe Kanaski is going to be sharing about uh, his missions trips that he's taken to Mexico and, and sharing some of that story. So if uh, you're a man, come on out to that. I encourage you to, to spend time together uh, with other guys from the church. That, again, is December 1st. There's a lot of other announcements. Um, there is a, a uh, Connect card in the, in the bulletin also. It tears off rather easily. And so uh, you can fill that out and put it in the basket on your way out the door if you have any praises or prayer requests, uh, things like that. Well, like I said, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As we work our way through 1 Corinthians, I have something to confess to you this morning. I, uh, some of you are like, this isn't a confession. I, we already know this about you. Um, I am slightly impatient. Don't, okay, don't laugh, all right? So, like, like I, am, I am a little impatient at times. Um, I, I like to kind of keep moving and keep going, and, and when things go my way, I tend to be a little happier than when they don't go my way. Um, and some of you, you know, you're smiling, but I'm not looking at anybody specifically unless you want to raise your hand, but how many of you would say maybe you're a bit like that too? Like, you, you kind of like it when things roll your way, right? Right? And when things don't go your way, you're not, maybe, some of you are, but some of you are not the type of people that like to uh, just take that with a smile on your face. You know, you, you kind of, you, you, you don't, I, I struggle to wait. That's what I was thinking about this week. I struggle to wait for, uh, for things that um, any normal human being would wait for. And so, um, like, like lines. How many of you, I, I hate standing in lines. I will drive simply because it's like motion and I feel like I'm doing something. I will drive down the road to a store that, has, that I know has less lines, even though it's like 10 miles away, just so I don't have to stand in line because standing in line makes you like wait. If you've ever been to Walmart, you understand what this is like. Like, like why, why not hire more cashiers and open up all those lanes? You know, you just, I, I absolutely... I don't like to wait. We struggle to wait. I ordered a, uh, I ordered a new snowblower this year. Um, had to get a new one, and, and I ordered it off of Amazon. Okay? Now, Amazon, I have prime shipping because, you know, I don't like waiting, so I like getting it in two days. And, and you know, at the end of the second day, I found myself going, where's my snowblower? Right? Like, did you ever think about how amazing that is? Like, I mean... The fact that they can ship pretty much anything to you that you want within a two-day period, and usually it comes in two days, is pretty amazing. Yet, how many of us still have found the time to go, or, you know, we get to that point where we're like, and two days is, I mean, it's, it's the end of day two here. Like, uh, I'm getting a little impatient. I've, I'm just, I struggle with this. And I know, I know that I'm not the only one. We, we are surrounded by impatient people. I was in Panera the other day, and we were, uh, we were in line. I was in line. I was there by myself and grabbing lunch real quick before I, to go, to come back to the office. And we're standing in line, and it was right at that time of, in Panera where there's usually a line. And so the one right here in Orchard Park. So, so there's, there are a couple registers open because they were training people, which makes you wait. And so, so I, you know, I got there, and I'm like, okay, you know, this is, I know I'm going to be talking about this in a few weeks. Like, this is, this is really good practice, you know, to stand in line behind these people who are not moving very fast. And so... So, uh, so, so the one, one lady in our line is, is training, and the, there's a very elderly woman who's trying to pay uh, 
and struggling to pay at the register. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm just like, I'm kind of doing one of these. And then I hear this. I hear from behind me. Ugh! I'm like, okay. Did somebody fall? Do I turn around and look? I'm not really sure. <laughs> and, and, and I hear it again. Oh, this is painful. And everyone starts to turn around and look. And it's the gentleman behind me. Older gentleman should have known better than to be shouting out in Panera. So anyway, so I, 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 I kind of look at him as everyone else does. And he looks at me and goes... <laughs> Sorry, I'm sharing this at church. <laughs> he goes, this is what happens when ladies get in front of you in line. <laughs> so, so, so I turn back around and, and I immediately realize that the people in line in front of me thought I was with this guy. And so rather than have a very good pastorly moment there where I go, well, the good Lord Jesus teaches us to encourage one another, I immediately was like, I, I, mm -mm, I'm not, no. I don't know this guy. I'm not with him. And, and he, got to the, he got to the register, <laughs> finally, and he just, he's going, oh, this is painful. We, we. Now, obviously, that was an extreme example, but it really happened. We, we, we tend to be impatient, and we tend to be impatient because we're self-centered people, right? Like, we all struggle with selfishness to a certain extent. Even me standing in line, I mean, think about this. Even me standing in line going, I know I have to wait. I know I have to wait. This is okay. I can wait. That lady is eventually going to pay. Even though I'm not shouting out like the guy behind me, it's really inherently a selfish thing going on in me, Right? And we've all, we've all been there. We've, we've, we've struggled uh, to think of others before ourselves because we're selfish. We struggle to wait for others because of a, our selfish motives. We, we think, you're slowing me down, or I have places to go, or there's, there's things that I have to do, and, and you need to move aside so I can get those things done that I need to get done. And we, we, we tend not to, we, we don't think of others sometimes. It's natural sometimes unfortunately, in a scary way, sometimes flows out of us. And I know, I know I'm not the only one. I struggle to wait. Apparently, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there were those who were struggling to wait uh, also. We find in 1 Corinthians, uh, throughout these chapters that we've been looking at, has to do with, um, really it has to do with unity. And, uh, and there's some disruptions in the, in the Corinthian church here. And in chapter 11, you find, uh, again, Paul uh, using examples, and he talks, about, he talks about women earlier in the chapter. Um, he talks about and their, their place in worship, um, which we're not going to focus on uh, today, but we're going to look at the Lord's Supper, which was another example of, of, of the Lord's Supper was not necessarily the problem here. The problem was selfishness. The problem was disunity uh, within the church, and it was happening around the Lord's Supper. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, um, if you want, you can just follow along. Hopefully you have your Bibles. The, the scripture will be there, up there on the, on the screen. It says this, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. So Paul here, as he's writing to the Corinthians, he's, this is quite a rebuke. This is, I mean, think about this. Think about this. Our, our district superintendent's going to be with us in a couple weeks, okay? He's come in, and, and he's going to share the word and, and share some, some things from our, uh, what's going on in the broader Wesleyan church. And so he'll be here. And imagine this. Imagine if, imagine if he comes in, experiences the whole service, comes up to preach, and says this. Says, your meetings do more harm than good. That's quite a rebuke, Right? Like, that's a big deal. So Paul, is, as, as, a, as a, a bit of a bishop here to the, to the Corinthian church, is saying, you're missing the boat, Corinthians. Like, you are, what are you doing? And in fact, it's not even just awful. 
It's really bad. It's not even just like, hey, I'm glad you're meeting. Hopefully nobody else joins you. No, you are actually doing harm, harm to one another. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, he says. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be a different, there, no, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. Now, when you look into this text, it's, it's an interesting text, this comment of Paul's, because we're not sure exactly what it means. S was there a need for some actually to, to, uh, to elevate their, themselves over others, for example, in this church? Uh, was, it a, was it an issue of, of Paul saying, you know what, there are those who need to be mature and, and need to show their maturity in, in order to encourage others to be mature? I'm, I'm not sure if that's what it is. Some, some scholars, as, as I looked into this, said that, that, uh, uh, that there could have been a sin issue in the church and that as disunity was taking place, that people were polarizing around an issue of, of, of clear sin and there were those in the church who, uh, the righteous ones who would say, you know what, I'm, I'm not part of this. Um, and then there were those who were willing to be part of it, yet still wanted to be part of the church. Um, then again, there's also, uh, there's also a bit of Paul that's sarcastic. I don't know if you've ever read through the New Testament and found those places. There are times where Paul is, um, he says some things that are like, you know, they're like jabs and, and, and sarcasm. And I, I think this actually might be one of those times. He says in 19, no doubt there have to be differences, right, among you to show which, you, uh, which of you have God's approval. Because the whole chapter here and the whole uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, as you go on, it's all about love and it's all about unity. And so I don't think Paul's going to say anything to draw people apart. He's, he's pointing out that there should be no separation. In fact, we find that he talks about this separation that's taking place in, uh, in the Lord's Supper. He's constantly talking about love and choosing a loving position of submission with our, our, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. You know, we know this passage, um, from this passage, that the early church did communion very differently than us. It, it was it's just a different practice, a different thing that they were doing. Oftentimes they would gather together and they would, they would eat a meal together. And that and, and communion was a longer process. It was a time of everyone coming together and gathering and, and eating and, and remembering while they were communing with one another the sacrifice that, that Jesus would make. It was a full meal rather than the small cer ceremony. And it's possible here that this meal, which was supposed to represent remembering, Remembering the, the, the broken and bloodied body of Christ that was given for the forgiveness of sins, that was, that was given over for us, that this, that this act, that this meal had become something very, 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 very different. Very different from what Paul intends, uh, what Jesus taught that it should be. You find, um, if you look at the culture back then, uh, and what was happening particularly in the Corinthian church, you find that the church was rather small at the time. Um, we know that because we find that they could gather together. I mean, a whole city, a, you know, a whole church could gather together, yet they also most likely didn't have a, a building to gather in, right? Um, young church. So, so where are they meeting? They're meeting where so many other young churches even today meet. They're probably meeting in homes. Yet, Yet to have a church of 40 or 50 in your home, there's probably those, you know, who have affluence, right? There are those who maybe are the haves in the Christian group over the have-nots in the Christian group. Yet they're, they're still, the group is made up of, of, of affluent and wealthy all the way down to, to slaves and laborers, people who all throughout different segments of society would call themselves Christians, and they were to, to be coming together for this meal. 
this equalizing communion time. And what was happening was something very different. Possibly, this meal had become something of uh, a bit of a charity, in a sense. Um, possibly, the, 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 those who in the church were haves, those who uh, could provide a meal for everyone, um, were organizing a meal and inviting those who, uh, who didn't have, which is good, but at the same time, they were placing themselves above um, those who didn't have. We find that there was some type of disruption, that possibly this meal ha had become a, a time where they would take communion um, and they drew lines between each other. We're not exactly sure. Paul doesn't go into tons of detail uh, on this, but we're not exactly sure what this meal looked like, but there was some type of separation. There was possibly those who had to work the meal, in a sense, it's, well, I provided the food, and I know you're a Christian brother and sister, but you're, you're the one who works it. So why don't you go get food for me? And in fact, why don't you serve all of us first who are seated, seated at, the, at the table of honor closest to the host? And so communion was becoming serving others and, and, and those who were expected to come along and, and being invited even to come along were eating last or they weren't eating at all because those who were wealthier, those who were more affluent or had more status were eating first. They were eating till, they're, till they were full. They were eating uh, uh, abundantly. And they drew lines between the members of the church based on status. And Paul tells us that this is messed up. Like this is not like this is not what you should do. And he's, he's upset. I don't want you to hear, I want you to read this passage and recognize that Paul is not happy with the Corinthian church, particularly on this issue of unity, but even more importantly, that you have, you have taken this disunity and you have allowed it to come in to communion. The place where we are to be equal as a church, where we are all to come recognizing our need for Jesus Christ. You're messing it up. So Paul begins again to clarify in verse 22. And this is a passage we read all the time. We read often these, this passage of, of, uh, during communion. Verse 22 says, Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, so Paul, is, Paul is telling the Corinthian church what they already knew. This, this wasn't a mystery to them. This is a reminder. This is a, a correction. It's a rebuke, but it's, a, it's not new teaching. This is something that the Corinthians already understood. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Let's, let's talk about that for just a second because that's those are some strong words from Paul, right? Like, you better do this the right way. And oftentimes we as Christians thousands of years later have said, what does that look like? Well, how am I supposed to take communion? What happens if I, I mean, did I sin this morning? Should I stay in my seat when the communion cup goes by? I'm not sure what, what's going on. You know what Paul's talking about here with the church in, in Corinth? Unity. He's saying if you eat and drink this and yet you think you are better than your brother and sister and you are distorting community and you are not in community and acting as one with one another, then you are, you are unworthy and unwor you are drinking and taking the cup in an unworthy manner and will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
Think about what he is saying there. He is saying that, that as you, when you, this, he's telling us this, that disunity among the body is sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. It's literally saying that there's this tie-in between um, our, 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 our spiritual unity with one another and our physical health. That's what Paul's saying here. We don't think of it that way, do we? We don't think of our spirit oftentimes and how healthy we are spiritually impacting our, our physical body. But this is one of those places, among others, where Paul says that it does. That there's a physical element. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why, verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. It's an interesting statement. Paul's saying, you know what? This is something that you have the ability to look inwardly and fix. Like this disunity among you, this inability to think of others, you can fix this. Look inwardly and look at yourselves. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. And, we are, and when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. Wait for each other. The issue in Corinth was not about etiquette. It was not about waiting uh, for everyone to get to the table before they ate. It was not about, uh, did, 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 did everybody sit down before the, 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 the evening meal was, or the prayer was said. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't about, uh, uh, you know, saying the blessing in the right way or taking even communion in the proper way. This was about rude Christians not caring about other Christians around them. It was. It was. It was an inability to put other people first. And Paul was disgusted by the fact that the Corinthians would call this communion. That they would call this the Lord's Supper. Verse 33. I read it already, but it says, So then, my brothers, when you come together, when you do this, wait for each other. Those words popped out to me. I know they're simple words. Um, but we struggle to wait for one another, don't we? We struggle to have unity at times as, as a church, as a body of believers. We, we struggle to think of others before ourselves. We like to put ourselves first. We, 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 we struggle to think of the best for others. So how do we do this? How do we, how do, we do this? I, I think there's, there's, there's several different teachings found in Paul. You find that that Paul is not just addressing the Corinthians here on what it means to be unified and to choose to love one another. He talks about it in Ephesians 4. He talks about it in, in Romans chapter 12. And really, Paul is simply echoing Jesus' prayer. You remember the prayer in John 17? Right? Jesus, Jesus prays to the Father and he, he just simply says, Father, make them one as you and I are one. As you and I are connected, make, make the church one. In fact, as you read on in 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 13 and going into 14 and well through the rest of the book, I encourage you to do that. Figure out how many times the word one is used. It's a lot. It's a lot. We're to wait for one another. And this is a theme in Paul's book. So how do we do this? I would say that this issue within the church is very important today. Like how to be unified and how to, how to, how to, uh, to love one another within the church. And I think it's really important. I mean, it's important always, but I think it's very important for today because we live in a world, we live in a country that is extremely divided. 
It is. It's just, I mean, everybody knows I mean, we're, that there's lots of reasons for that, but we are experiencing division. And oftentimes, even those things that are worldly concerns and worldly uh, uh, things tend to divide us even in the church. And Paul is saying here that we are to, in a sense, to wait for others, that we are to uh, be more concerned with ourselves than with, uh, or be more concerned with others than ourselves. And so Paul puts this emphasis uh, on us to think of, uh, first, of others as more important than ourselves. And I think that that's more important than ever now. There are a lot of things that have found their way into the body of Christ. I think you'd be surprised at how many people believe in the body of Christ things differently than you do. They just think about things differently. They think about politics differently than you. They think about sexuality different than you. They think about religion. They think about issues that our, our, our government faces, like taxes and immigration. They think differently than you. And I think you might be surprised by that. But Paul tells us that we are still to be one because there is something greater than being right or wrong. There is love. And he goes into this. He goes into that. I, I'm, I don't want to steal. Dan's going to be talking about that in a little, a little bit um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But even though we believe things differently, and it causes us to act on those things differently. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should be models of unity. The, the world should look at the church, particularly right now, and see nothing but communion, unity with one another and with the God that we call our Savior. Let me give you a couple thoughts. A couple thoughts that, uh, if you want, you can write down um, on how we can stay connected, how we can be united with one another. Just a real big truth here. Um, I don't know if you know this. I say it all the time. I know Pastor Dan says it all the time. Uh, we say it because the Word of God says it all the time. We need each other. We weren't designed to be a church of, of, of one individual. We were designed to be a church that, that was a, the body of Christ, that all had specific uh, gifts and abilities given to us by the Holy Spirit, that all had certain uh, tendencies and characteristics, and sometimes those things are even in conflict with one another, like they seem like they won't go together, yet over and over again, the Word of God tells us that we are to be one, that we desperately need one another. We could not significantly impact the world around us without without each other. It's hard enough for us to do that with our neighbors or our co-workers, one-on-one. -on -one. No, we need to be the church and we need to be united in order to make an impact for God. I love the way Paul talks about this. I already mentioned it, but Romans chapter 12 is a book you, or a chapter you should read today as we, as we uh, uh, later on today. Or, or um, Ephesians chapter 4. You know, look into how Paul describes the church and tells us that we are to be one. We are many parts of this, this one body. It's obvious that we're not called to just attend church, but we are called to be the church. And you are part of that broader body because you are, the part, you are part of the body of Christ. You have something significant to offer. And that's a promise. That's a promise from God that he says, you know what, I am going to give you spiritual gifts. I am going to bless you uh, with my presence and with my spirit working in amazing ways in your life. And you know why I'm going to do that? So that you can build up and support the body. Not so that you can just show off your own gifts, but so that you can build up and support the body. The good news is, is that unity is not the same as uniformity, Right? Like we, we don't all have to be the same. But called, Paul does call us to be united. We need each other. And then there's another thing that I want us to remember. Is that we need to love like Jesus loved. Sounds simple, right? John 14, verses 34 and 35. I don't have it up there on the screen, but uh, Jesus says this, a new command I give you, to love one another. 
He doesn't go into like, let me tell you this new command and it's super deep and crazy hard to do. He just says, love one another. And then he says, by how you love one another, you will be known. You will be known as my disciples, as my followers. You will be known as the church, the body of one, by how well you love one another. Notice what Jesus didn't say. We talked about this two weeks ago when we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Jesus doesn't say here, Paul doesn't say that you need to be right. You don't need to be right. You want to know why? Because there are times when you're wrong. There's times when I'm wrong. But we are still called to love one another, to submit to one another. And we can't all be right. But there are times when we are called to, uh, to submit to one another. Right? I'm just curious to know, how many of you, um, just by show of hands, would say that like, you have a perfect marriage? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, dude, you just got married. That's why you're raising your hand. <laughs> give, it, give, it, give it a little while. So raise your hand. Anyway, Chelsea was like, no, we don't. Anyway, so um, we don't have perfect marriages, right? And we don't have, I don't have a perfect marriage. You know why I don't have a perfect marriage? Because I'm part of it. Like, that's why. That's why. And I don't know if you know this, but there are times, I got to say this with all of you here uh, in front of my wife, so she can't hit me. Uh, ne- like, she wouldn't do that in front of all of you. Um, I'm right sometimes. Did you know that? Like, I am right sometimes. Like, there are decisions and things that we need to do in marriage, and I am like, like, I know I'm right. How many of you are right sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm just causing fights all over the place. This is going to be great. Good. Happy Sunday, everybody. So, so there are times where I am right, and I know I'm right. And guess what? There are times where she is right, and she knows she's right. And, and, and if we live that way, where we only had to figure out who's more right, who's more wrong, what should we, if we live that way, man, it would tear our marriage apart. What makes our marriage last, what makes your marriages last, is this submission, this equal submission to one another. This, this equal sacrifice, this willing, I mean, we all make fun of, we all make fun of the, the, the wisdom that most men are given, that the most popular words, the best words to say to your wife is, yes, dear, right? But there is some truth to that. That's not just a giving up. That's a, that's a submission. That's a willingness to say, you know what? You know what matters way more whether, uh, than I'm, whether I'm right or you're wrong or vice versa? Is that we choose to love one another. That we choose that. We need to choose to love one another. I know that's an example of marriage And we should be able to do that with the person who we're closest to in this world. But Paul goes out and says, you know what? You need to be able to do that with everyone. That we need to look at the body of Christ and be willing to equally submit. Now, some of us, we don't like, we don't like the word submission. We don't like the word to give up our, uh, something that means giving up our place. And who are we to think that we have to do that? What happens if I know I'm right? You know, the, the entire understanding and our entire understanding of, of Jesus Christ is based on his willingness to, to submit, to, to give up his rights, to give up his freedom, to give up his life for those who thought they were right, those who demanded that, 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 that he gave up his life and he submitted and gave up and his, 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 to, to the point of put on, being put on a cross and dying that way for us. And some of us, we look around and we go, yeah, that's, 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 you know, I get that. I get that. But guess what? You want to know who Jesus died for and is submitting to even now? Because the atonement is still ongoing. It's not a once and done type of thing. It's like we are still experiencing the, the, the forgiveness of Christ and that, that saving grace of Christ is still active in our lives. And guess who else's life it's active in? Guess who else he thought of? Your neighbor who hates him. 
Your coworker, who, who is the farthest thing from a follower of Christ, Jesus is submitting to them and, ta- and willingly giving up for them because he loves them. And if Jesus can do that, shouldn't his followers be willing to give up? Shouldn't his followers at least, I mean, Jesus gave up his life for people who despised and hated him. Shouldn't we be able to give up some of our, our, our preferences or our, shouldn't we be able to submit to the, to, the, to, the, to the ones that are in the body of Christ? Jesus modeled this. Jesus modeled this. And more than ever, in today's culture, the church, us, the body of Christ needs to model unity. I want you to close your eyes and I just want you to, I'm gonna, I want you to take a moment to pray for yourself because I'm not gonna, I don't wanna pretend to fill in the blanks for you. Like, I don't know, I don't know what this looks like or means in your life, but I can tell you this, that all of us have these areas where we refuse to, in a sense, wait for other people. We refuse to, we, we struggle to put them first. We struggle to, to submit or to, to love them in, in a place that, that requires us to give up something. Maybe you have that in your life. Maybe for some of you, it is your spouse. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a coworker or a friend or a parent. And so what I want you to do this morning, just briefly, I, just, I want you to have it, some time with God. Take a moment and pray and ask God uh, to do a, an amazing work in, in your life. Take a moment and and pray. Father, I'd ask that you would forgive us for times that selfishness take root in our lives and in our hearts. God, I know that, Lord, we, we need to work towards fixing this issue. Lord, Paul even says that, oh Lord, right here, that we have an opportunity to examine ourselves. God, we thank you that we don't do this alone, that, Lord, that if we choose to look inward and, and, and discover things about our, our selfishness that are there, that are deep-rooted, God, that, that your spirit will work in us and through us, and that, God, as you even share in 1 Corinthians 12 and later in 13, that, uh, God, you'll call us to, to this incredible love for one another. God, I pray that, Lord, for those who are really struggling with this, whether it be a lot or a little, whether uh, they've struggled to equally submit to, 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 um, Lord, whatever that may be, whatever it looks like, wherever it looks like, in their families or in their workplaces, Lord, I ask that, um, Father, you would root out selfishness. God, that you would allow us to become people who think of others first. God, I don't pray this prayer for everyone here but me. Lord, I ask that for me also. God, would you allow us to serve you better in love? God, would you allow us to serve others better in love? Father, when we we feel like pushing our way to the front by uh, being right or, or, or defending our point, God, may we be reminded of the words in 1 Corinthians and in these chapters that tell us what it really truly means to love others. God, this is difficult. I'm not going to pretty it up with any other words, Lord. It is difficult to do this. God, to love others who seem to not show us an equal amount of love back. But Lord, it's what you call us to do. God, I thank you that Um, Lord, in a few weeks, we get to take communion together. 
God, I thank you that we do that together. I thank you that we have the opportunity, even though it looks very different than what the early church did, God, that we have the opportunity to, to commune with one another and to recognize the sacrifice that you've made for us. God, I pray that this issue, as we even prepare for the, in the next few weeks to take communion, God, would you begin to work on this issue of disunity in our hearts? God, where we struggle with others in the body, God, would you begin to soften our hearts? Would you begin to change our minds, Lord? Not, not to a point where even necessarily we, we just agree with everything, but Father, that we would understand what it means truly to be different and unique, yet, yet be part of one body. God, we thank you for how you guided Paul, particularly in this book of 1 Corinthians. God, we thank you that love out, outshines everything. God, I pray that for all of us as the church, not just within, but, with, but outside of this place, God, may we be known not by what we know or whether we're right or have the right stance or the right uh, thoughts. or the right, I mean, things are important, but Father, I pray that we would be known by how well we love not just one another, but the world around us. God, I pray that we would see the answer of Jesus in, in John 17 answered. God, that you would make us one. God, you are good. And we love you. We thank you for your countless blessings. And we look forward to what you'll do in us and through us this week as you've gifted each one of us uniquely. God, as we study 1 Corinthians even more in depth over the next couple of weeks, God, illuminate our minds. May we understand what you are calling us to do. Father, we love you. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, Next week, uh, we are looking into 1 Corinthians chapters 15 and 16. So if you're looking for reading, take some time. Um, also, uh, take some time. If you haven't looked online, there are some devotionals that go into greater depth of what we've been talking about. They're great things to, to use as study guides throughout the week. And so get into the book of 1 Corinthians and, uh, and continue to grow in your love. God bless. We'll see you next week.